Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Cross and Crown Channel is about presenting powerful proof for the Christian faith. If you want to support Mike as he makes videos and writes books, just go to Mike's Patreon page at patreon.com backslash mrob and kick in a buck or so. If you join us over there, that would be awesome. Supporting this work will help bring countless people to Christ. If you like this video, there's a donation button on our main YouTube page. Thanks for hanging out. Good evening. This is Cross and Crown Radio and the Gospel Truth Podcast. And I'm Mike Robinson, your host. we got an interesting program. We're going to be talking about atheism, specifically a certain uh, type that's kind of in the minority by far, uh, Platonism. And so we're going to be t touching on uh, Plato's forms and seeing how that works with reality and whether it can work with your reality. Uh, if you want more on this subject, you can get my book, Atheism and the Folly of Reality. You can get that on Amazon, Atheism, Reality, and you can get that on Amazon by Mike Robinson. Also, the question of the day is this. Do you think atheists are getting more desperate in their questions since modern atheists, many of the new atheists, hello Jill, so good to have you, since many of what's called the new atheists uh, say that they don't have any answers, they don't have to give any answers, they only have questions, the question of the night is, do you think that the atheists are getting more desperate with their questions? Also, you can see on our link there in the Facebook uh, description, as well as when it goes over to YouTube, is our Patreon link. If you want to go over there and support, we really can help that. We just started that out, and we need some help throwing a buck or five bucks, whatever. So uh, Platonism, uh, of course, contradicts Scripture. So we know right at the start it can't be true. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Many of you know that the Greek word for word, <laughs> hope you don't get confused about that, but the Greek word for the word word is logos, which is where we get logic and many other things. Uh, in the Greek thought, as well as uh, certain areas of Jewish thought, uh, we, we see the idea that the logos was more than just logic, more than just an organizing principle, but the, the foundation for all reality. That's why God says in the beginning or in Archie. It's a dual truth there at least. One going back to Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, but also the arche is the foundation of all things in Greek thought. So this is really important when we read, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and arche was the word or the logos. So that's really important. Hello, David. So good to have you tonight. So Platonism uh, contradicts Scripture, and we're going to see why it cannot possibly be true. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 through 8 says this. Jesus speaking says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. So notice that sometimes the cults will say, well, the Bible nowhere says that Jesus is Almighty God. Jesus doesn't call himself God anywhere. Well, there Jesus calls himself not only God, but Almighty God. So there goes that. But notice he is the Alpha and the Omega. So everything that we see within our physical world, anything material and immaterial, anything of this world and beyond this world, all depends on Jesus. And that's important to know. Um, behind this unreliable world of appearances, though, the Platonists say, are these things that are called forms or ideas. And so these forms or these ideas are behind everything, like a perfect triangle. Where do we get this idea of a triangle? Hello, Mike, so good to have you. The idea or the form of a triangle is out there in Yonderville somewhere in the immaterial realm, and the perfect triangle is there, and all other triangles in our world or the ideas of triangles in our world that we try to uh, impose upon the world are just forms like the original perfect form of triangle. Same with squares, same with numbers, the number one, the number two, and on and on. Now concerning the idea of a perfect triangle, you, you might try to pencil a perfect triangle, maybe get a machine to do a, a perfect triangle, you'll never be able to pull it off. So the Platonists are right about that where they say nothing in our physical world can you get a perfect geometrical shape. 
whether it's a square, a circle, a triangle. You can't get it. So where's the idea of this perfection, this perfect triangle come from? Because when they do geometrical uh, mathematical uh, truths and proofs, they have to have and utilize perfect triangles, perfect circles, and perfect squares. And yet, in our physical reality, nowhere do we see a perfect square, perfect circle, or perfect triangle, and on and on. And so, according to Plato, any conceivable thing or property there is, there's a corresponding form that's perfect. So there's a form that's called a perfect dog somewhere. And of course, when you understand genetics, you see that can't really be the case. You know, physically, you cannot see that you can go back and find a perfect form of a dog. Hello, Arthur. So good to have you. So they have the idea of the plateness of a tree, a house, a mountain, a man, a woman, a ship, a cloud, a horse, a dog, a table, and a chair. These are examples in our physical world of what's deposited somewhere in the material world, immaterial world, as a form or an idea, according to Plato and according to certain atheists that call themselves Platonists. See, the problem is uh, some atheists are smart enough to know that there has to be some immaterial things out there. There are certain things that we describe and we see and we understand and we have to presuppose that are immaterial. And so they're honest enough to admit that. Most atheists don't. Most atheists, of course, are materialists. They only believe in the material world, only in the physical world. But the small little minority of Platonists, they say, well, there has to be some kind of perfect forms like Plato said because they don't want to go to God because they want to remain an atheist. Even though they do know that God exists, how do we know that the atheists know that God exists? Because Romans 1 tells us that they know the God exists, but they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. You can get that in Romans chapter 1. Now, some atheists are truly good at convincing themselves that they're an atheist, that they really don't believe in God. But when you talk to them enough, you'll see that even, even if Romans 1 didn't say that, you could see that atheists truly do believe in God. They just don't like him. They don't want to see his moral law imposed upon their own life. And so they try to avoid him. They try to suppress that truth in unrighteousness, but they know in their heart of hearts that God exists. Hello, Chris, so good to have you. How does that work? It kind of works like this. It's like uh, the mother who has the, the real rotten son. Let's call him Joey. Joey's a really rotten son, right? And everybody knows little Joey's rotten, but the mom doesn't. The mom never admits little Joey's rotten. So Joey goes to spend the night at a friend's house, and the mother of Joey calls up and says to Joey's mother, you gotta take Joey back because Joey just uh, got caught stealing out of my purse. And Joey's mother said, oh no, you must be just persecuting Joey. Joey would never do that. You guys must have set him up. I'm gonna go get Joey. So she goes and gets Joey. Then Joey's at school the next day and uh, the principal calls and says, oh, little Joey got caught uh, disrupting the class again. And the mother says, oh no, Joey would never ever do that, right? And so she goes on with hearing all these things from so many people for, for days and weeks and years the, of the things that little Joey has done wrong, but she never admits. She even gets really passionate about the idea that Joey's a good kid. And so she will never admit it. She almost seems like she would pass a lie detector test with such zeal for defending her own son that she believes is not one who's doing bad things. And yet, at night, she hides her keys and her wallet and locks the liquor cabinet every night. Why? Because she knows that little Joey is a rotten kid. And atheists know that God exists. How do we know that? Because Romans tells us. Also because atheists must utilize uh, only things that the Christian worldview can supply, like the law of non-contradiction, like moral absolutes, like uh, universal mutables, like true truth. All these things, even when they try to say those things don't exist, they must utilize those things in anything that they talk about and everything that they do. So the atheists borrow from the Christian worldview, trying to say, well, God doesn't exist. And so they're very similar to little Joey's mom. It's also like the guy, he, he's a, a, a guy who hates ladies, right? He, he dislikes women, but he never admits it. He says, oh no, I, I don't have anything against women. I'm not a misogynist at all. No, I, I, I don't have anything against women. But yet every time the radio goes on and there's a woman on the, the radio, he turns a channel. When he walks down the street and there's a lady coming at him, he crosses the street. Anytime a, a, a lady salesperson comes to him at a store, he asks for a, a, a man. Um, every time he sees a, a, a lady announcer on the TV, he changes the channel. 
and yet he says he doesn't dislike women. But everything he does proves that he does have a problem with women. And so that's similar with the atheists who say, oh, God doesn't exist. All the while they're utilizing what they know only God can provide. So those are a couple illustrations of that. So the Platonists are a form of uh, some of them. Uh, there are obviously theistic Platonists, even Christian Platonists. But tonight we're going to be talking about atheists who uh, take on and uphold uh, Plato's forms and his ideas. So the, the Christian knows that God is foundation for the laws of logic and other immaterial, immutable truths. We know that, including all these so-called forms. All these truths are actually in God's mind. God is the, the source of all truth, so we know that. Hello, Dean, so good to have you. Hello, Chris. So God must exist uh, for us to understand ideas and forms because they're posited in God's mind. How do we know that? It, very, very simple. Um, the form, of, let's say, of a perfect triangle. It's unchanging, okay? That truth is unchanging. It's never going to change. A triangle, a certain way, it's never going to change. Okay, a square is always going to have four sides. That's never going to change. So, Platon's form of a square, never, ever going to change. Okay, it's immutable. Okay? Now, everything in the physical world changes. Every single thing, including your brain. Okay? So, if we try to live upon just a physical, atheistic worldview, that only the physical exists, we cannot account for these unchanging universal entities, including uh, squares, okay? So the atheists are, the materialistic atheists are done at the start. So the Platonist atheists, they say, okay, we do recognize that one plus one equals two, and that form is unchanging, and it's universal, and it's always there. It's a form just existing somewhere in the immaterial realm, right? A different Platonists have different ideas about that. We won't get into that. But that's what they say. So all these uh, selected universals uh, are just forms. And uh, diverse schools affirm these immaterial Platonic forms of one sort or another, but they cannot produce a ground for these forms. Notice that. There's no foundation for them. They just kind of exist out there. How do you know that? That's very arbitrary. Well, they just are. They just do. See, they have no answer. There's no explanatory power for a, an atheistic Platonist. There isn't any. He's got to tell us where they come from. And so there's so many forms, there's an infinite amount of forms. So it gets really complicated and they have no place to have a, have a foundation or ground for these forms. We'll show you why they're wrong in just a little bit. The human mind and the material cosmos are not immutable. They don't have universal reach or range. So they cannot be the foundation for these immutable uh, universal forms. So materialistic atheism is done. So it has to either be Christianity or some sort of religious uh, view that has a foundation or maybe a, a type of uh, Platonism that is atheistic. But there's lots of problems. Uh, Platonic forms are arbitrary. Think about it. Arbitrary just means that they just whatever your opinion is they're very subjective there's no objective uh, place for them whatever you make up you just say right in other words there's so many variety of forms you can see how they get arbitrary is mud a form is urine a form is skin a form you ask them these questions and the platonists they, they don't have any answers they really don't the you know some of the real high thinking ones come up with answers for some of these things but the answers are not consistent and again there's no ultimate foundation for them when and who decides when a form that's the, the platon uh, platonist idea when is a form a one and not another what do i mean by that think about it this way when is the form that's called a creek you know the, the little flowing water that's a creek so platon says well there's a form somewhere and in, in the immaterial realm that's a creek okay let's grant them that for a second there's a form that's called creek somewhere out there. And so all creeks are, uh, you know, a, a type of picture of the uh, form of a creek in Platon's forms. Okay, when does, when a creek gets filled with water and maybe gets larger, when does it become a stream or a river? At what point can you make the creek either a stream or a river? How does, how do you judge that? Who, who makes that decision? You can see how it's arbitrary. When, when does a hill... When is a hill large enough to be a mountain form? So you got the forms that are called hills. 
you have the forms that are called mountains. And they're up there in Platon's realm somewhere, right? When is a hill large enough to be called a mountain? Who makes that decision? Who makes that distinction? Who can call that? Who can be the referee for that? See, there has to be a personality involved. You can't just have a, a, a cloud of forms out there somewhere just coexisting for all eternity uh, all by themselves without any personality behind them. So the Christian understands these universal mutables and in other types of things that could be called ideas or forms that everything that's true comes from the mind of God. So we think God's thoughts after him. When we look at a world and we, we, we discern certain things, we utilize categories and concepts and perhaps ideas, all these things come from God. And so we're made in God's image and so we can do these things. For the atheists, they have no place of foundation. When does a, uh, a sea, you know, a body of water, a sea, that's a form, right? It's out there, the, the form that's called a sea, a body of water. When is it big enough to be called an ocean, right? And who makes that decision? You can see it. It, it really makes no sense. And are Platon's forms something definite? If so, where do they reside? Is there any ontology uh, behind them? Is there any substance? Is a, are they made up of anything? Where are they? What do they consist of? The Platonists can't tell you, right? It, so you can see this Platonism resting on atheism has almost no explanatory power. Now, you, you contrast that with Christianity, the Christian worldview has colossal explanatory power. Everything you see in the universe, physically and non-physically, material and immaterial, everything infinite or finite, eternal or temporal, everything within that we think about, that we speak about, that we do, God can explain every single thing. It's not a God of the gaps. It's a God of necessity. God must be there for us to understand these things and to explain these things. Platonism can only explain a few things. Uh, materialistic atheism cannot explain anything, period. Can't even explain itself. And when atheism attacks Christianity, it's actually resting on a Christian worldview to mount that attack. We'll get into that a little bit also. So if one suggests that Platon's forms are transcendent, how do they affect the land of the living? If they're up there transcendent somewhere in the, the sky, in the immaterial sky, how do they affect the physical world? They don't have any causal powers, right? So how do they? We know that God has causal powers. God is transcendent, but he's also imminent. He's also here with us because he's omnipresent. He has personality, he has power. So we know that God can impose things on reality. But how do forms sitting up there in the immaterial sky somewhere, how do they cause anything to happen? How do they interpose themselves upon anything? It makes no sense at all. And so this is something that one can explore. And I hope those Christians, when you, when you get deep into apologetics or in, in some level of philosophy, you'll, you'll bump up against some atheistic Platonists because it's really the only place that they can hide out and be relatively logical, at least in the surface, surface level. Hello, Jeff, so good to have you. But as like you, like you can see, as you press a little bit, as you pick in it a little bit, as you examine a little bit, you can see the fault lines. Next question is, are the forms, these forms are ideas, Platon's forms, are they a temporal and a spatial? If they are, how do they affect the temporal and the spatial realm? It makes no sense. They have no powers behind them. They have no personality behind them. They have no force behind them. So how do they close that gap? Forms are impersonal. They have no will. They have no power to act and determine things. So how can a non-theistic form rule as God rules? If all of a sudden the form rules as God rules and the form is omniscient and um, has all, all power and is everywhere present and has personality, all these things, pretty soon a rose by any other name is just a rose and all you're doing is uh, just renaming who God is, which you don't want to do because the Bible says in Exodus 3.14, when Moses asked, who should I see sent me? Uh, God says, tell them I am that I am sent you. Notice that. The powerful name of God, I am that I am. Remember, that name was revealed over 2,500 years ago, over uh, 3,000 years ago, right? 
over 3,000 years ago. Think about that. Some guys in sandals, you know, pitching tents in the desert, came up with that type of name? How could they possibly have such a high level of theological sophistication? How could they have such a high level of philosophical scrutiny that the name could go through? In other words, I am that I am demonstrates and reveals that God has a seity, God has self-existence, that he is necessary, that there's that he's not contingent upon anything. How could these guys, these, these guys with the, the sheep out in the desert come up with this? There's no way unless it was actually revealed by God. It was stood 3,000 years and even the last 500 years of philosophical scrutiny, logical scrutiny, rational scrutiny, and it comes out shining and blazing as the truth. I am that I am. That's powerful. That's an amazing proof for the Bible. Just God's name. No other religion got that right. Only the Christian religion built upon the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the New Testament reveals that God is the I am that I am. Remember when Jesus is arrested. Jesus employed the, the name I am a lot on himself, calling himself God. Ego I me. But he's about to get arrested, right? And um, Judas gives him a kiss, and they ask, are you Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am. And what happens at that point? Just by Jesus speaking the name, all the Roman soldiers fall down like dominoes. Boom, 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 boom. You can imagine that. The power of the name demonstrating if he wanted to, he could call down a legion of angels and take care of business. But he was prophesied, and it was determined by God's counsel that Jesus was going to die on the cross for the sins of his people, and that's good news. Now, if one denies Christian theism, I cannot see any evidence that there's a form of forms anywhere. It would have to be God. God would have to be the author of anything that is universal and immutable. So what I call universal immutables, like true truth, like a square, like two plus two is four, always, universally, okay? unchangingly. It's always that way. It can't escape that. A is A, the law of identity. It's a universal immutable. The law of non-contradiction is a universal immutable. Only God who has universal reach and power and who is immutable, which means unchanging, can be the fount, the fountain, the source, and the ground, and the foundation for these universal immutables. So that's powerful. Now, if you're trying to still be a Platonist, an atheistic Platonist, who decides or determines the properties of each form? Who does? Who's, who's a, the, the arbiter for that? <laughs> you know, is it a panel somewhere? Is it, you know, some kind of a league of superheroes somewhere? No, next one. How does one know that a specific form will have the same properties tomorrow or next year? It, it's similar to the problem of induction for the atheist. We know that because God has declared things and revealed things, certain things are going to be like they are today, like they are today, they'll be that way tomorrow. But how does an atheist know that? An atheist doesn't have a God controlling all things and reveals that things are going to be the same. How do they have that, an answer to that? How do they know the forms that they posit now in their platonic realm somewhere, in the, 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 the skies of the immaterial reality, they say, how do they know those forms are not going to change tomorrow or next year or in 10 years? They don't because they're not God. So God would be the only one who would know the properties of each form, whether it's a triangle, a square, or a mathematical truth like 2 plus 2 equals 4, or the law of identity. Any of these so-called platonic forms, if they're immutable, only God would know that. There's no way an atheist could know that. He can't because he can't see tomorrow. God does and tells us. Of course, they're based upon also God's nature. A theory of forms fails to explain most of reality. It appears that such theories lack the ability to explain change, right? So what they say is going on on Earth in the physical reality is kind of a, a, a fuzzy picture, a fax, if you will, of the real form that's perfect up there in the heavenlies, okay? But yet the things down here on Earth change, right? The forms up there are perfect and they're unchangeable. How can they explain that? They have no explanation for that. Only Christian worldview has the explanatory power to do that. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God is the Alpha and He's the Omega. 
and Jesus Christ came and revealed him. Jesus was and is God manifest in the flesh. And that's good news. He's the first and he's the last. He's God Almighty. We can trust him. The Christian worldview has tremendous explanatory power. It can explain everything in the universe. It appears that the theory of ungrounded forms falls infinitely short for accounting to anything that we see in our physical world. So, uh, you know, I say there's no reason to be a Platonist. Um, it seems like they're trying to press Bigfoot's foot into the Dorothy's ruby slippers with the theory of forms into our world, and it doesn't matter. If you want more, like I said earlier, you can get my book called Reality and the Folly of Atheism. It's on Amazon, or you can get my book, God Does Exist. Also, if you have a chance, subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is on Facebook right now, but it's going over to YouTube, Cross and Crown Radio on YouTube. We have hundreds and hundreds of videos on subjects like agnosticism, evolution, flying saucers, um, uh, time travel, uh, light, all these type of subjects, science, how science requires God, and on and on. Cross and Crown Radio, if you go there and subscribe, uh, that really helps. There's also a donation button there, and you, there's a little bell. If you press that, you'll be notified. So atheism has no proof. Christianity has colossal amount of evidence and proof. Most atheists trot out the materialism. Most atheists are not Platonists, and they try to polish up the absurdity, but it never, ever works. Um, any flight from God and reason is a flight from reality. Real reality does exist. We know that. We know we're not a brain in the vault. We know we're not stuck in a matrix. Why? Because God's word reveals so. God must exist and his revelation must be there for us to know anything at all. Since we do know things, God must exist. All who deny Christian theism obviously fall on their own sword and fall into irrationalism because a Christian worldview must be true. This is really powerful to know this. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in God, but I believe in the Easter Bunny, or I believe in uh, leprechauns, or flying spaghetti mo monster, or how is your God different from Shiva, or Thor, or uh, Allah, or any of these other uh, so-called gods, or, or immaterial beings. It's very, very easy. All you have to do is go to the nature of that being, that God alone has a nature. Like, I have human nature, you have human nature. Your dog has dog nature, okay? God has divine nature. God has God's nature. God's nature, like we said earlier, is unchanging. And he has universal reach and power and authority because he's omnipresent, has all power. So God has all those things. The Easter Bunny doesn't have that. Leprechauns don't have that. Uh, all the false gods do not have that. The closest one you can come to is, is Allah, who apes some of the attributes of God, but... The Quran, as well as the Hadith, reveal Allah is utterly transcendent, and you can't know anything about him. He has, listen to this, Allah has no true attributes. So Allah has no true attributes. That would include the attributes of immutability. In other words, of a being who cannot change. He cannot have the attribute of being universal in power and reach, since Allah has no true attributes. So Allah cannot account for these universal immutables, just like all these other false beings. So Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, Thor, Pixies, all these type of beings, Spaghetti Monster, Flying Spaghetti Monster, they do not have the nature, the ontology, the makeup of their being that can account for these things. Only the God of the Bible does. That's fascinating. That's amazing. That's stupendous. That's one of the main reasons we know that the God of the Bible must exist. So God exists, uh, the um, contrary is not even possible. Um, is there a God? Uh, one atheist says no. What is the nature of reality? What physics says it is. This is Rosenberg. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? There is none. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. Does prayer work? Of course not. Is there a soul? Are you kidding? Is there free will? Not a chance. What happens to us when we die? Um, you're gone. And this is what Rosenberg says. So notice this. He's admitting, that this is one of the most famous atheists here, Rosenberg. He's admitting that atheism cannot explain anything. <laughs> he's not saying it that directly, he's saying it indirectly. And that there's no hope. Of course, atheism is false, and we're glad that it is. 
but it cannot answer anything. It has no explanatory power. Materialistic atheism has nothing to offer whatsoever. And it borrows anything that it can say, anything that it can assert, it borrows from the Christian worldview. And as it, as it asserts its nonsense, it stultifies itself. It refutes itself. And that's amazing. And so we know that uh, atheism is false. Uh, I mean, think about it this way. How did life originate? Look that up on YouTube. Watch the atheist stammer and stutter trying to answer that one. How did life? Well, we don't know. It just happened billions of years ago. Since it happened billion years ago, they, they can, they're not to explain it, right? Even though Pastor and other uh, Christian scientists uh, disproved the idea of spontaneous generation well over 100 years ago. Before that, they could say, well, yeah, spontaneous generation just popped into being. But that was disproved. And now, though, they're saying, okay, we believe in a biogenesis. Not biogenesis, but A, meaning not. So they don't believe that life begets life, that somehow, somewhere, life just popped into being. Well, show us how that works. So they, they get these experiments. Miller tried in the 50s. Nobody's improved upon his experiment. And they get all the, the, the particular elements that are needed for life, and they put them all together. They throw energy in there and other uh, constitutes that they think might help form life. And they never get life. Okay, even as they're designing it, even as they're using their intelligence to design the possibility of creating life, they still haven't been able to do it. Now, if they use their intelligence and take God's own material and make life, they're just proving that God had to be there to make life. What they need is experiments where they just have a bunch of material sitting out there and life just pops up by itself without them designing it. They'd have to have cameras on that. Of course, they know that it's never going to happen, so they try to design life. They haven't been able to for well over 50 years, over 60 years. They've not been able to design life in a lab, even using the elements they know make up life, all the amino acids in the, in the correct left-hand, right-hand uh, position, all the particular minerals, uh, all these type of uh, uh, items, the, the right level of oxygen and nitrogen, in other gases and chemicals, all in the right spot, in the right place, the right time, they still cannot create life. And again, if they do in the future and they design it, that actually proves that God created uh, life because an intelligent agent had to be utilized, had to be used to create life. This is amazing. And yet it goes way over their head because, again, they're suppressing that, that truth in unrighteousness. They know that. And when you think about the, the greatest scientists in history, Isaac Newton is one of them. He's one of the, probably one of the one or two top scientists in history. Strong believer in the Bible. He, even, he wrote more books on Christianity and the Bible than he did on science. Isaac Newton, strong believer in God. Um, Robert Boyle, known as the first modern chemist, credited with laying the foundation for modern chemistry. He wrote his book, Skeptical Chemist, and it's obviously the foundation for modern chemistry. He endowed, he, he actually taught a lecture series called the Boyle Lectures, of course, named after him. And this is the reason he did this. Notice this. The guy who founded modern chemistry, strong Christian, he said this. Why did he do it? For proving the Christian religion against notorious infidels. Okay. Him and Newton would just thrash these modern atheists if they were alive today. But we know that, um, uh, you know, that Christianity must be true. We know that God must exist because the contrary is impossible. We already, we already showed that earlier. But think of just in our practical world, in our biological world. In every single cell, not most, not 90%, not 99%, every single cell living cell on the planet has DNA. That's amazing. DNA is a code. Let's just keep it simple. You can read the articles in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, science literature and magazines. When they talk about the DNA, they talk about uh, encyclopedias full of information. They talk about copying the information. They talk about language. They talk about paragraphs. They talk about sentences. They talk about um, an alphabet. They talk about all these things that all require a mind, right? They all presuppose a mind, okay? But let's get let's make it even simpler. 
the DNA code. That's what you teach your children. Let them think this through because they'll see this all through school and high school. The DNA code. If you have a code, what do you need? A code giver, right? A code never comes by itself. If, um, as I'm shooting this show uh, just next to the, the, the studio, if there was a, uh, a branch of a tree and the wind was blowing it, it was kind of hitting on the side of the building, I could hear it scratching. And I was listening to its scratches and it, 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 had, it just made nonsense. No information there, no sentences being uh, brought out, nothing, right? But what if I heard a similar sound, but it was, it was, it was uh, tapping out Morse code by that same branch or by something that sounded like a branch. And it was saying, there's a mad clown who's got me held hostage outside. I need help. If I heard that in Morse code, code, I would know there's an intelligence behind it. I'd call 911 and try to go out there and help the person, right? Get them away from that mad clown. <laughs> You would know there's intelligence behind. Why? Because there's a code. We know every single code. There's a code giver. During World War II, when the uh, Americans were trying to break the Nazi code, right? They were having intelligent people trying to break down the code to get the information to understand what the Nazis were communicating, right? We we utilized uh, a lot of our our code making from certain Native American tribes where their code would be very very difficult to break. But it was information. There were sentences and paragraphs and and and, and uh, chapters, if you will, written, uh, but in the Native American language that uh, the the Nazis and the Axis of Powers could not uh, discern and it could not break. So they couldn't break the code. But it was a code. The DNA is a code. We've broken the code, and it has leagues of information in it. Obviously. Notice what's so fascinating about this is, like I said earlier, every single living thing on the planet has a DNA code. You say, well, why didn't God put made by God on the bottom of anything? He did. He put it in every single living cell. Plus, you can see design in the universe and the cosmos, how mathematically precise everything swings and hangs and moves, right? You have to have a lot more blind faith to believe all this was an accident, then God created. Show me one place anywhere where a code doesn't require an intelligence. Show me one place. Because in the DNA code, we know an intelligence put it there. And that, of course, is God. There's no doubt about it. It must be. So um, that's enough on atheism for tonight. Uh, but we'll get into some herbs now. A lot of you know that I'm a certified nutritionist, and as a certified nutritionist, um, I keep up on the literature. Even though I'm a pastor and I'm an author, I'm writing a book, uh, God and Nutrition. I don't have the title yet. I'm trying to get something that's a little unique, because I think I have a, a pretty unique perspective, because I'm up to date on uh, the literature, and things have changed a lot the last five years. I think there's so much good uh, scientific studies going on that we do have um, some real solid truth on nutrition for once. You know, in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s, a lot of that information is wrong. And we, we were guessing, we had small studies, studies that weren't done correctly. But now there's been a, a lot of scientific research that's been doing with great numbers of studies, including double blind studies. So um, let's get into some herbs. Herbs that are good for your health. I used to not take so many herbs because there wasn't a lot of research done on herbs when I first became a certified nutritionist in the 1980s. So I was more of a guy dealing with amino acids and, and uh, vitamins and minerals and such matters, more things that you could make sense chemically of. Uh, herbs are so many different chemical uh, elements within each herb that the, the research wasn't done effectively at that point. But now we have a lot of research. The number one herb I would say take is raw garlic. Yeah, I know your family will run, your lover will run, and it'll be hard to be in social context. So take the raw garlic when you can, when you're not going to be around people. Also, one note, with raw garlic, it can keep some people awake. It gives you a lot of energy, usually not um, energy produced by the adrenal gland, but it can keep you awake. It keeps my wife awake and it can keep me awake also. 
Um, so don't take garlic uh, late at night if it'll keep you awake. You have to kind of play that by ear yourself. But a lot of people don't know that garlic can keep you awake. Uh, but so it's a very powerful herb, raw garlic. Great for blood pressure, great for cholesterol. Even some evidence that it can um, remove plaque from your arteries. Seems to uh, suggest that you have less chance of dementia and possibly Alzheimer's if you take a lot of raw garlic, including, um, which is not raw garlic, but aged garlic, like Kyolic. Kyolic is one of the better companies making aged garlic. Aged garlic itself has been uh, un, uh, been researched a lot recently, and it's been shown that it gives great memory retention, and it even helps with learning deficits. Uh, it's great for your neuron survival, which shows that as you age, your brain tends to shrink just a little bit at a time. After you get about age 30, 35, your brain begins to shrink a little bit, called brain shrinkage. Uh, Raw garlic, as well as aged garlic, seems to stop the shrinkage or slow it down. Also, it brings up serotonin levels, which helps your mood. When you eat a, 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 a meal with a lot of garlic, you'll see you feel uplifted. Some of it could be the carbohydrates, but also the garlic, right? Now, S. alicystine, which is also SAC as an abbreviation, helps guard against Alzheimer's disease, and that's one of the elements within aged garlic. So I'd highly recommend that. The second, I would say, if I had to list them, second most important herb is turmeric. Turmeric is relatively inexpensive. You can get it from Puritan's Pride. I think uh, they usually have a sale, buy one, get two free, or buy one and get one free. They have great sales. I've been utilizing their products since the late 1980s. Very good quality. And turmeric, you can get turmeric there, or you can use it as a spice. It's just hard to use it uh, enough as a spice. Now, when I talk about these herbs, talk to your doctor or certified nutritionist yourself to see if you should take these things. Because garlic it thins the blood slightly, so you got to be careful if you're on blood thinners. Also, uh, turmeric thins the blood fairly drastically, at least for an herb. Not so much as a, a pharmaceutical would, but it does thin the blood. But turmeric is great for your memory. It helps reduce the oxidation process within your brain, which is great. It also reduces inflammation in your brain as well as the rest of your body. And what's fascinating about it is it crosses the blood-brain barrier, which is fascinating. So turmeric, very, very good for your brain, very, very good to possibly avoid certain types of cancer. And it also helps uh, lessen the amount of buildup of certain plaque that is responsible, they think, for Alzheimer's. So try to get uh, turmeric and garlic, but like I said earlier, talk to your doctor or a certified nutritionist. If you don't have one, you can always message me. I should be able to get back to you in two or three weeks on that. Ginger, also really good. Again, a blood thinner, but very, very good for your, your, your cardiovascular system, and it's also anti-inflammatory, so it seems to also help the lungs. That's ginger. Be careful again because it's a slight blood thinner. Dandelion is great diuretic, you know, very good. So you got to be careful when you take, you don't want to take it too late in the day. You might be up at night going to the restroom, right? Very, very good blood cleanser and cleanser of the liver, okay? Now, there's a lot of good hard science behind these things now. This is not just some old Chinese guys saying, well, they've been usually using these herbs for thousands of years, so you can trust them. It's not just that now. They have a lot of double-blind research on these particular nutrients and herbs. Ginseng, great for your blood sugar, will give you uh, some energy and is very, very good for men. So I recommend that. Astrologus, great for your immune system. Very, very good for your immune system. If you catch a cold or a flu, if you catch it early enough and you take astrologus, you'll have less an amount of the particular symptoms. Possibly it might even get rid of the symptoms. I'd also recommend ginkgo for your, your brain. It's great for the memory. If you're a college student or you're taking um, college classes and you're worried about uh, studying, uh, you can take ginkgo. Uh, it might also give you a little bit of energy, so be careful of taking it too late at night, uh, unless you don't mind if you don't fall asleep that night and you can test it on yourself. But if you have to get up early the next day, try not to take garlic or ginkgo, but take those earlier in the day and, and be careful with whatever you take, whether they're vitamins, pharmaceuticals, or herbs, check with a uh, particular professional before you 
engage those products. There's lots of great information on the internet, lots of great resources, a lot of very intelligent people, a lot of honest people. But because certain things work for a certain person under certain conditions does not mean that herb is good for you because of your body type, because of your particular lifestyle, because of how you eat, because your family history, your genetic profile, and because you might be taking certain pharmaceuticals or other nutrients or herbs. So you cannot just self-medicate even when it comes to herbs. I know it's tempting because you'll see some really smart people out there that really care and they recommend this or that or this. Be careful with those things and um, you know tread lightly and safely in those. If you want to get more information on my apologetics, you can get my book that I wrote about Greg Bonson. I wrote uh, the book called Greg Bonson, The Man Atheists Feared the Most. You can get that on Amazon. You can also get my paperback, God Does Exist. That book is used in Bible schools as well as seminaries. And there's another ebook that's called Defeating Relativism and Subjectivism. And it also examines self-refuting statements. You can get that by Mike Robinson also on Amazon. And if you've been listening uh, earlier, you heard the truth of Christianity that God must exist that Plato's forms uh, by themselves as a brute truth cannot exist. They need a foundation. They have no causal powers. They need a grounding for them uh, to be interposed upon the world. And of course, all truth is from what God already knows. And so God reveals a lot of truth to us and we can see certain things or the general equity from scriptures, revelation, and be able to apply that to our world. But the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's the gospel. The word gospel means the good news. And Romans 1, 16 says it's a power of God unto salvation. The content of the gospel, as I said earlier, is Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. And if, if you've heard about Jesus tonight and, and God has, has really been changing your heart through his word and spirit, through his grace, just call out to him, profess him. Just say, Father, I believe. I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus is the son of God. I believe Jesus died on the cross for all my sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead on the third day. This I believe, I turn from my life, I give him my whole heart and all of my days, I'll live for him all of my life. Live that and do that. Now join a good church, start reading the Bible even tonight before you go to bed. You can get a Bible app for your phone or your computer. You can get a physical Bible at the store if you don't have one, but read the Bible. Start with the Gospel of John if you recently came to Christ. If you want any of my books, we'll send you two free books. All you have to do is message us or email us or contact us on YouTube or on Facebook or other platforms. We really appreciate all you listening. We appreciate all you that give to our Patreon page and our donation button there on YouTube at Cross and Crown Radio. And so thank you so much for being with us tonight. Until next time, this is Pastor Mike Robinson saying, may God richly bless you. Thanks for joining us at Life Church today. It's our joy to play a role in all God is doing in and through your life. We would love to continue with you on that journey. If you have any questions or prayer requests, visit lifechurchtoday.com or email us. We offer free counseling and a free Bible school because we train numerous people into ministry. Use your talents and answer God's call. God wants to do so much for you and through you. If you would like to give, click the donation button on the site. Pastor Robinson's 40 books are on Amazon.